So um, this is uh, Rhonda's research team, and they're here uh, actually representing a sort of a sister project to ours, uh, which is called Enriched, and it's specifically on pregnancy and, uh, and weight gain in pregnancy. Uh, Rhonda has um, a PhD in human nutrition and a long background in research in the origins of disease. Mm -hmm. Developmental origins of disease. Origins of yeah. disease. Uh, and so we're really excited to see uh, all the new oh. stuff that they have to share with us. And they're also working in the course of their CREO project on five A's for pregnancy. So this is kind of a neat opportunity to have a preview of some of those thing, things that are coming down the pipe. Uh, and so uh, we're really excited that they were able to join us today. So I'll hand it over. Great. Thank you, um, Denise, for the invitation. Being so enthusiastic and bright-eyed on what is getting to be the holiday time. And I don't know about your organization so well, but around the university, we're all kind of dragging ourselves towards the end of the semester and getting things done. So um, anyways, I really appreciate all of you being here and so present for uh, this presentation. So I'm going to try and stand in the field of vision for the video camera, but if I'm in the way of the slides or anything, please just give me a shout or a wave and, and I'll move over. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to talk to you about today, and, and I know you've got some discussion coming up in the next while after this presentation, is promoting healthy weights in pregnancy through healthy eating. And I put this, this extra line, implementing recommendations, uh, because my understanding from Denise and others that I had contact with, Jody and so forth, um, is that you're very interested in the practical side of things. And so I'm going to say right up front, I do not bring the practical things to you, but I am going to bring some questions to you that I hope will help you and then ultimately help all of us identify some practical, real practical strategies to use in, in different settings. So my, uh, the learning objectives, uh, and again, this was done in consultation with Denise and others, are to first of all understand that excess gestational weight gain is an independent modifiable risk factor for adverse outcomes in pregnancy. I'd like to spend some time summarizing the Health Canada recommendations for weight gain and for dietary intake because they are uh, the weight gain guidelines in particular have been updated regular or updated recently. Um, they're more complicated than they used to be. And the dietary recommendations for any of you who are dietitians in the audience or who have any nutrition background. I know people find dietary recommendations to just be quite complicated, generally. Um, I'd like to look at a bit of the results from an environmental scan that we've been working on, really through a couple of uh, dietetic interns now, but former students in our program, to look at key features of programs um, out in the literature that show support uh, for healthy eating in pregnancy and to also discuss practical strategies for women and I'm using the abbreviation healthcare HCP healthcare providers uh, throughout the presentation so to discuss practical strategies that might promote healthy eating and appropriate weight gain and that's really the focus. You'll notice that I'm not talking about physical activity it's not that physical activity isn't important but the focus here is really on um, healthy eating and dietary intake as opposed to physical activity but we recognize that that's a very important part of the process as well. So as I'm going through my talk I thought I'd, I'd start with these questions up front so that you have them in your mind and then also I've got them at the end of the session just so that we can bring them back and you can think about them. What practical advice strategies or other um, supports help women and you may well have um, something to say about that. You may have a lot more experience that you could add to this discussion. One big question we are beginning to struggle with is who are the health professionals to best support women and how can this be done? And this really speaks to this um, idea that multidisciplinary teams work together, many people have different roles and sometimes although you want the whole team to be on the same page and delivering the same message, 
sometimes one member or two members of the team may be the most important and others may be more supportive. So this is going to be a big, not a struggle, but something to figure out, I think, for weight gain and pregnancy. We have a question about what supports do healthcare providers need to accomplish this. And then another question, we've just left it as healthy weight gain in pregnancy, but what about postpartum? It's, it's a continuum, right? Pregnancy through lactation through to the postpartum period normally is considered about the first year uh, post-delivery. Um, what do we say about postpartum? Because this is, is, is a big deal as well. And I'll, I'll give you some information on that. Okay, so let's just start first off the bat with gestational weight gain and pregnancy outcomes. So this fellow is a fellow named Dr. David Barker. Dr. David Barker and his colleague Nick Hales, um, David Barker was, was from the University of Southampton, Nick Hales was from Cambridge, and together they came up with something that has been termed the developmental origins of adult disease. So starting on this diagram, if we think about pregnancy, pre-pregnancy to pregnancy, being a time, so when women are pregnant, the developing fetus, which obviously is developing within the mother, is influenced by a number of different environmental factors, all of which can have an impact on how that fetus develops. One of the most common examples for um, nutrition in particular would be folate intake. So for example, we know that women who have low folate have an increased risk for neural tube defects. And so we know that the nutritional environment during pregnancy can have a long and pro-lasting, or pro prolonged and lasting effect on that developing fetus. So it's not just things like nutritional deficiencies though, it's many different types of foods, energies, and a wide variety of nutrients that can all impact on the long-term development, or on the, the, the neonatal development, first of all, of that infant, that can place that infant at risk for chronic disease in later life. And the big discovery or the big forward-thinking motion that Dr. Barker and Dr. Hales put forward was that things like undernutrition, so it's not frank malnutrition, but undernutrition just generally, had the potential to influence infants and infant development such that as that infant um, moves through their lifespan, they actually have an increased risk, not just of developmental disorders, but of chronic disease. And of those chronic diseases, we're thinking of um, particularly cardiovascular disease, diabetes, but they've also now linked it with cancer, mental illness, and many other diseases that show up much later in life. Now, in some situations, depending on exactly what that perturbation is here, the infant may go on immediately, not immediately, but over its life course, uh, you know, as an adult, to develop chronic disease. But most often, it seems like we need, or that infant um, and child, um, will ultimately be at much higher risk if the food, energy, and nutrient um, intake it has during the course of its lifetime also um, promotes the development of chronic disease. So it's this idea about two hits. So you have one hit being poor nutritional status during pregnancy, during the mother's pregnancy, and then the second hit may be things like an overabundance of energy intake, an under um, expenditure of energy during the lifetime leading to obesity, say during adolescence or during early adulthood, that really prompts the development of adult disease. So this is the Barker hypothesis, and I put the David Barker's picture up here. Um, sadly, Dr. Barker just passed away this last uh, August. And so this was really, he spent decades actually working on this. This has been shown now in many epidemiological studies and animal models, and there are a number of long-term studies that are going on worldwide now that are based on this hypothesis, really looking at how this works and, and the extent to which it translates. And it translates across many, many populations now in the world. Now. I want to say two more things. So one of the things that Barker and Hales also showed was that if that person who is at high risk for long-term um, health risks like diabetes and so forth is a woman, then that woman actually can pass on the risk that was incurred by her mother 
to pass on the higher risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and so forth, um, to her offspring. And so it's this whole idea that it is actually a multi-generational effect. So it's not just, doesn't just stop in the first generation, but this actually continues, the risk continues into subsequent generations. And that's extremely powerful and slightly disturbing. And, and um, I'm sure you can understand, or I'm sure you appreciate the fact that, it, you know, if it stopped right here, well, that'd be, you know, one generation. But in fact, at least in animal models, we've already shown that it goes on for at least three generations with no further perturbation to the female offspring. So it goes on not just to the children, grandchildren, and the grandchildren's children. Um, you can see these increased risks. So that's one thing, it's multi-generational. The other thing that Barker and Hales actually don't talk a lot about, but we're becoming more and more aware of, is that, you know, that mother, she actually has a life of her own that exists beyond her ability or beyond her delivering a child out into the world. You might be surprised to hear that, that women actually have their own health risks. And so one of the things, again, that it looks like food um, energy, in particular in nutrient intake during, um, during pregnancy, has a long-term impact on her own health. And we're going to eat all the time when they come, and it's used as a gross indicator of healthy pregnancy, certainly if women are gaining far too much or far too little, and normally it's far too little, that often prompts some kind of clinical intervention or certainly further examination, further exploration about why that might be. Um, this is data that was published way back in the 60s, and it was by the fellow who did the classic studies of what weight gain uh, looks like, what, where weight is, is gained during pregnancy. So first of all, we have the really the products of conception. So this is the fetus plus, the, uh, plus amniotic fluid. Um, it's deposited in maternal tissues deposited in tissue in the fluid that's within the tissues and then it's also deposited in maternal stores so these would include fat stores that we see deposited uh, particularly in the breast tissue hips and so forth um, that are specific to pregnancy and if we look um, Hyten um, noted that it was about 12.5 kilos in total and that's basically where the recommendations came from a long time ago was somebody dissecting out and figuring out where all of those tissues were. If we look back at a historical perspective on the weight gain guidelines, and this is a very, there's a lot of literature written about this. If anybody is, wants to read them, I can pass you the um, references. But before 1990, and I would say after my mother was pregnant with me, and I won't tell you exactly how old I am, but you can guess, um, the, the approximate weight gain or the uh, recommended weight gain was similar for all women and it was on the order of 12 kilos, about 25 pounds, and that was kind of given sometimes as a range, sometimes as a single number, but it was kind of a ballpark. But it was assumed that all women should gain the same amount of weight. In 1990, the, or the Institute of Medicine, which is a multinational group within the U.S., tasked with reviewing the literature, looked and said, you know, there's a lot of, particularly in the U.S., there's a lot of low birth weight. And how can we best avoid low birth weight? And it was with that in mind, avoiding low birth weight, preventing a small for gestational age, that they came up with weight gain recommendations that, first of all, um, had the message that all women must gain at least a particular amount of weight, and that amount of weight was based on pre-pregnancy BMI. So according to where you started prior to pregnancy, women should gain at least an amount of whatever it was. And this was, um, this was really interpreted as, again, a minimum. So gain at least this, but if you gain more, just keep gaining, just keep going. And in um, 2000, it was actually 2009 that the IOM in the US came out, but Canada adopted these guidelines in 2010. These guidelines were refined again because there was a recognition that women were gaining more weight than was healthy. And I'm gonna show you some of the implications of that. 
So after 2010, these um, 1990 guidelines were, were refined to, first of all, recommend weight gain within a recommended range. So it's not just at least. It's at least this much, but not more than that much. The range uh, depends, again, on BMI classifications. For those of you who remember back into the 1990s in a professional way, um, the, uh, the uh, BMI um, classifications were not established, that we use today, were not established in 1990. And so in the interim 20 years, there was an establishment of more current um, classification system. And so the weight gain guideline lines were brought in to um, be aligned with the current classifications of BMI. And the other thing that was, was determined was weight gain, not just total weight gain for the whole pregnancy, but also a weekly rate of weight gain. And those are the advancements that we um, see here. So here are the weight gain guidelines, and these may be very familiar to you. They're published by Health Canada. They're also available through the Institute of Medicine. So again, we see, um, first of all, pre-pregnancy BMI. So depending on where a woman starts, determines what her total weight gain should be, or sh the recommended range. These categories, underweight, normal weight, um, overweight, and obese, align with our current definitions of the category. So that's good. Um, the ranges, again, are based on the evidence so far of both avoiding complications of pregnancy and um, related to child, uh, to weight at birth. And that's really where most of the evidence is currently situated. So we know about pregnancy complications and weight at birth. And we do know a little bit beyond that. And then, as I mentioned before, there's a weekly rate of weight gain that's also recommended. And these are rates that are recommended during the second and third trimester only. The recommendation is that women do not gain much, which much, weight um, within the first trimester. So we've done some work um, with a study. I don't know if you've heard of the Alberta Pregnancy Outcomes and Nutrition Apron study or not. It's a cohort study of Alberta women, mainly in Calgary and Edmonton. Um, and we looked at whether or not um, the extent to which these women adhere to weight gain guidelines as presented in the last slide. So what we see across the x-axis are our categories, underweight, normal, overweight, and obese, and then we've got a population total. And if I just put the first bar up, this is the proportion of each group of women who achieved less than the recommended amounts of total weight gain throughout pregnancy. And these are measured weights. They're in a, uh, a study. We've got at least two and sometimes three weights on them throughout pregnancy, so we can look at this in quite uh, good detail. So let's just pay attention first to the total, and we can see that 12%, this is out of six, the first 600 women, there's 2,200 women in apron, but this was the first 600. So 12% of them gained less than is recommended. 32% of them gained within recommendations. And 56% of them gained above recommendations. And it's quite interesting, first of all, if we look, we really don't have that many women who are in the underweight category, and that reflects the Canadian population today. We have a lot of women in uh, apron who are in the normal weight category prior to pregnancy, and about 48, 46 rather, percent of them gain above recommendations. If we look at women who are overweight and obese, then about 80% of them gain above recommendations. Now in part, this is because you'll remember that the recommendations are for women who are in these two categories to gain less weight than women who are in the normal weight category. So it's more difficult for them to stay within the guidelines, for sure. But again, it sort of hits home. First of all, the 56% tells us that pretty much all women um, may be at risk for gaining ex outside the guidelines. Um, you know, it's close to 40, well, 46% or so of our women who are starting out at a normal weight gain outside the guidelines and that you're at a much higher risk for gaining outside guidelines if your starting weight uh, is a little higher to begin with. 
In terms of what the consequences are, so okay, women gain too much weight or they gain outside the guidelines, big deal. Um, so this is some of the data that comes from one of our colleagues in Ottawa, Zach Ferrero and uh, Christy Adamo. And what they did was in their cohort, it's an Ontario cohort, um, they looked at what some of the consequences were. And so what we see here is it's called a, a forest plot and basically it's looking at the odds of a woman having a baby that is large for gestational age according to, first of all, according to whether or not she, uh, what her pre-pregnancy category, pre-pregnancy body weight uh, category was, BMI category was. Um, and you can see that being overweight or obese, um, first of all, is a risk factor for having a big baby. But what was really important about this particular paper was over and above being overweight or obese, women who exceeded the guidelines were almost at a, about a three times, were three times more likely to have a baby that was large for gestational age. Um, additional consequences of excess weight gain include preeclampsia, impaired fetal development, including cleft palate and a number of other, particularly facial, um, manifestations, an emergency C-section, and then the last one I want to talk about is postpartum weight retention. And I didn't present the data for all of these, but I can share with you papers if you're interested in those areas. So again, data from APRON, we were really interested to look at postpartum weight retention because we have an actual measurement of women's body weights at three months postpartum. And so these are women, again, out of our first 600 who either gained less than the recommendations, who met the recommendations, or who gained above the recommendations. And this is fairly early postpartum. It's 12 weeks postpartum. But what you can see is that for women who met the recommendations, um, they were about three kilos heavier than their um, starting weights. Pro, um, 12 weeks postpartum. And for those who were above the recommendations, they were um, about six kilos heavier. And we can say that, well, this is a, you know, again, this is quite early postpartum. Perhaps they went on to lose weight. I can tell you that Alberta Health Services, you may have even been involved with some of their surveys that they sent out uh, last year. Maybe some of your clients were. Um, it, what it actually looks like, and this is cross-sectional study, so we can't say it's really the same women, but what it looks like is that women in Alberta, anyway, seem to lose weight up until about four or five months postpartum, and then they maintain, and then as they get um, closer to that one-year mark, they actually gain weight. So um, this idea that once you're into the postpartum phase, you just breastfeed, all the weight falls off, you never again have to worry about it, and that you know as long as you just keep breastfeeding, you're going to be absolutely fine. That doesn't seem to be the case. I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, though, right? So what are the dietary recommendations that are s intended to support um, healthy intake during pregnancy? Well, so we've got recommendations from Canada's Food Guide, our favorite, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. And I've divided them up into the different recommendations. So let's see, uh, okay, there we go. So the first one from Canada's Food Guide is to eat an extra two to three food guide servings from any food group. So this is only during trimesters two and three. And I'm just noting the food groups, fruit and vegetables, grains, milk and alternatives, meat and alternatives. There is no other food group. It's not part of Canada's food guide. So when we look at an extra two to three servings, it should be from these groups. It doesn't have chocolate bars, it doesn't have potato chips, it doesn't have 18 popsicles. Um, it has things like a one piece of fruit and three quarters of a piece of yogurt or one piece of toast and a cup of milk. So I think one of the things that is hammered home but is actually very difficult for people to grasp, and I'm not, I'm not claiming to really love that particular guideline because it's very confusing and people don't interpret it um, in the way that it was initially intended. So the next ones, uh, the next recommendations are to continue intake of cooked fish, consume adequate calcium and vitamin D, and increase in iron and folic acid intake. 
So notice that these, so we've got the cooked fish. This is for the long chain fatty acids that are intended to be important for infant brain development and retinal development. Calcium and vitamin D, iron and folic acid. In general, these are nutrient-based recommendations. So when people are trying to interpret this and make these into foods, it's really not that easy, except for one thing, and I'll show you that in a second. I'm saying supplements are often recommended as far as the literature shows and as far as our AHS survey shows. Supplements are always recommended. 99% of our, they're always recommended. Now, they may not always be taken, depends on exactly the segment of the population you're working with. But in our apron women, 99 to 100% of them are taking iron and or folic acid supplements. And in fact, their folic acid concentrations are massive. So this is kind of interesting. Next recommendation, limiting caffeine, eliminating alcohol. And then the last one is um, avoiding foods associated with foodborne illnesses. Now, one of the reasons I've put these all in different colors, and I think the message comes across quite strongly, this is actually kind of complicated. This is not just, you know, go out and kind of have, a, have an extra snack. There's lots of things that women are trying to balance, and they're trying to do the best for themselves, the best for their infants, but at the same time, they're kind of going, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to eat? And then we've got all the physiology of pregnancy on top of that. And so we took a look in the apron cohort to see whether or not women were actually able to work with these guidelines. And what we see is, first of all, if we look at um, fruits and vegetables. So women prior to pregnancy, we've got dietary data both prior to and during pregnancy. Prior to pregnancy, um, very few were eating four to the, sorry, seven to eight, um, meeting the guidelines, seven to eight servings per day. And it goes up a little bit during pregnancy. And I think that's very common. Very often if people want to improve their diet, they think, because of the messages that we put out, as long as I can get on fruit and vegetables, you know, that's all that matters. And truthfully, that's not the case during, during uh, pregnancy. So we see a little bit of an increase. Interesting, milk and alternates, 48% of women meeting it during pregnancy versus 23 prior to pregnancy. Something that women find very straightforward is the recommendation about calcium and they do that by getting a cup of milk. They start drinking milk. Just they never drank milk before or they drank a little bit, maybe milk in their coffee or tea or something, but they're quite happy to pour themselves glasses of milk, eat yogurt and so forth during pregnancy. Meat and alternates, um, really no difference in terms of the number of, of um, servings per day. One of the things that's interesting about this is that one shift we do see is rather than having uh, much red meat, women switch and they go very significantly to chicken. And there's very little red meat. And so this is a bit of a problem if we think about the iron recommendation. So it looks like there's no difference, but it, 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 there are differences in terms of their actual choices. Cooked fish, the messages around cooked fish are so confusing, they just say, forget it, I'm not eating fish. Or they're so nauseated and kind of feeling not very well and so forth, they don't want to have fish. And fish is really not part of our, rec or not part of our normal diet that often in Alberta. Um, iron, 23% um, of women are meeting their recommendations. This is through diet, that's not through supplements. So again, interesting to note that. That's probably that reduction in a um, number of different things. Folic acid, 45% of women meeting their recommendations through diet. So they have an impression that as long as I take my supplement, I'm good. As long as I'm taking my supplement, I don't have to worry about my diet in these two areas. Um, and that's probably not the case. Uh, limiting caffeine, many of them do limit caffeine, but they were limiting caffeine before pregnancy. Interestingly, um, and we're not quite sure what to make of this data, um, only 65% re um, reported avoiding alcohol. I was shocked. 65%. And this is a high, I gotta say, this is a highly educated, highly, um, highly motivated group. I mean, they're part of a big research study. They are, we call it, sometimes we call it our study of um, healthcare providers and former Olympic athletes, because we have a lot of Calgary 
athletes um, who are who are in our sample. So it's really interesting, and I some of this may be that um, they didn't notice, but we actually put beverages as examples on our questionnaires when we said, you know, what did you? We asked, them, what did you take in? What did you? increase, what did you decrease, and what did you avoid? And very, oh, 65% said they avoided alcohol. So I'm not quite sure what's going on there. It might be that they didn't avoid alcohol early in pregnancy, but once they knew they were pregnant, they were. Anyway, that deserves more exploration. So we also did a qualitative study of women, and we asked them, so we were asking them mainly about sugar intake, but we got a lot of information about just diet quality in general. And we asked them, so why, why are you making the changes that you're making? And they really fell into about four different categories of why they were making these adjustments. So one category was in this idea of making dietary changes to meet nutritional guidelines. And almost everybody who said they did this added milk to their diet. You know, I didn't eat or I didn't drink milk before, but now that I'm pregnant, it's really important that I have enough calcium. I'm going to add milk. So they did make a few things. And they also noted, this is also where they said, you know, those dietary recommendations about fish are too complicated. I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not going to bother trying to understand them. I'm just not going to eat fish because it also doesn't taste good. And so that's it. Many women were also dealing with the physical symptoms of pregnancy. And so that included nausea, vomiting, just not feeling terrific at all stages. Um, as people got towards the end of pregnancy, they were getting a lot of reflux and they were um, not able to eat large amounts. They were limiting fluid intake because they didn't want to have to get up and go to the bathroom so much. Um, so physical symptoms of pregnancy was one of the things that was driving um, what they chose. Uh, one woman said, this is one of my favorite quotes from this one. She said, I guess she'd had quite a um, she had a fair amount of nausea and vomiting. And uh, she said, I never feel sick after I eat a freezy. <laughs> um, lifestyle adjustments. Women talked about the fact that pregnancy is a time, temporary though it may be, where there's a lot of changes in your social interactions. So some of those changes promote um, Different eating patterns. So for example, women who used to use running or smoking or alcohol as stress relievers, they'd come home from work and they'd have a glass of wine before dinner. They're not drinking as much wine, at least in 65% of them, <laughs> not drinking as much wine. And so they would have a, a, a sugar sweetened beverage. They'd have pop or they'd have something else, juice. Um, they used to go out and play a team sport. So maybe they used to go out and were on a women's hockey team, or not hockey team, soccer team. There were quite a number of them, like I said, who were quite athletic prior to. So now they don't go out to play the soccer, but they still meet their teammates after the soccer game to go out and have um, refreshments. So then maybe they go for ice cream because ice cream is good too. Um, or maybe they go for, you know, even if they go to the bar, they're not, um, they're going to make a, typically they're going to make a choice that, um, again, is caloric. Also, other lifestyle adjustments that they talked about were, um, you know, not being able to do as much physical activity, not being able to get out as much. And so this, again, is just altering how they deal with their life around them and what their normal routine is. And they recognize that pregnancy is temporary, um, but I don't think your life is ever the same after you've had a baby, no matter what. And so, um, again, looking at what those lifestyle adjustments and what their choices are was important for their food intake. And then the sociocultural norms were really interesting. So they said, one woman had said, um, I'm in an office, we get cookies in, people bring me the cookies three times now. I used to just get the cookies once. If I said no, then that was okay. But now women, people are bringing them back. Your baby needs some. You're eating for two. Oh, come on. You can have some. Your weight's going up anyway. It doesn't matter. You know, have another cookie. Have another piece of cake. Have whatever treats brought to the office. Um, husbands were, or partners, were sort of in this, this ballpark. There was a group of partners who felt 
guilty, I'll say, about their, um, their wife feeling nauseated or not feeling so well, so made it a habit to bring home treats because they want to help them feel better. Um, there were a lot of mother-in-law stories, a lot of cultural stories, um, you know, just coming from different cultures. I'm looking at Hera because we've had a discussion about, um, I'll, I'll share with you, Hera's background is Greek, about um, the mother or the mother-in-law saying, manja, manja, you have to eat, you have to eat. You know, that's part of the culture and these are all things that influence diet quality. Um, and tip it in a way where diet quality tends to go down, which is quite surprising for pregnancy because it's a time typically where women are very interested in doing what's right for their health and for their baby. So it's with that, I'm going to just give a couple slides about our Enrich um, project program. Um, and this is a whole program looking at healthy weights in pregnancy and postpartum through healthy dietary intake. And we've got many, many partners um, in this project. So the goal of our Enrich program is to, to develop and evaluate universal and selected strategies to help women achieve healthy body weights and healthy diets in pregnancy and postpartum. I probably don't need to tell you what universal and selected strategies are, but for those of you who may not know, universal strategies apply to all women in Alberta and selected strategies are those aimed at more vulnerable um, populations. And to this end, again, we have a big team. We have um, six different objectives, really five different working objectives with respect to our research. Um, we've got one objective that's really dedicated at generating new information and has a number of studies going on through the university. Um, the one that I'm going to talk about most uh, that I think most applies to this group is one that we're working on with Alberta Health Services, pregnant and postpartum women and healthcare providers. And this is really in the universal strategy um, venue or, or vein, looking at, again, how to help a broad cross-section of women in supporting um, healthy eating and healthy weight gain. We've got some projects in community-based organizations, including multicultural health brokers. Jessica is really involved with some of those. Um, and uh, one or two groups in Calgary as well. We've got an Aboriginal community and looking at their women as well as their service providers. And you may know some of the people who I've put up the names here, um, myself obviously, um, Linda McCarger, some of you may have run um, across Linda over the years, professor in human nutrition at um, U of A. Paula Robson works for Alberta Health Services. She's the one in charge of the Tomorrow Project, has a lot of expertise in dietary assessment. Maria Mayan, um, Anne-Marie um, McGinnis and Terry Miller are, uh, are some of our provincial partners through Alberta Health Services and Ellen Toth is a very well-known endocrinologist here in town and um, has worked extensively with Aboriginal communities. So I'm getting, trying to get to the practical parts. So one of the things, not trying to, we're at the practical parts. So one of the things that we've done in part of the university-based part of our study so far is to do an environmental scan of program. I'll call them elements. These are different methodologies or different um, components to programs that appear to support appropriate gestational weight gain. So very extensive review of the literature. There are a number of systematic reviews that are out um, currently in the literature that we've had some students look through in great detail. But what they did was they picked each of the studies from these systematic reviews and they looked for what were the elements in programs that appeared to make them successful. What is it that people are actually doing that makes programs successful in promoting healthy weight gain and promoting healthy diets. So the first one was um, a combination of nutrition, physical activity, and behavior change strategies. So programs that used a full combination and a full complement of these strategies were more successful. Interestingly, the most um, successful ones were those where the message changed over the course of pregnancy. So the message given in the first trimester and the first meeting is different than the ones given in subsequent meetings and the ones given as pregnancy moves along and women are getting closer to delivery. So it's got that adaptation <coughs> across the um, course of pregnancy. 
Most successful programs begin early in pregnancy. The, in the literature, it's, they've recruited at less than, eight, uh, less than 16 weeks, if possible. Um, and it might even be possible in Canada to recruit or to have those early interventions, those early conversations, um, before this time. Maternal motivation and ongoing support were considered essential by women and by the people running these programs. And one of the things that this meant was continuity of care or this building trust and rapport with the same health care provider over time. So there was a sense that they would build a trusting relationship so that that person became a resource, became a part of that women's pregnancy experience. The terms healthy weight advisor and health mentor were less intimidating titles than nurse, dietitian, physician, um, and so forth. It, and I think, I, I'm not sure exactly why this is true, but it was. Um, and loss to follow up, particularly, this is potentially in the US mainly, uh, but loss to follow up was a problem. Women didn't want to have programs where they had to have it as one more intensive thing on top of an already busy life. So most women are still working during pregnancy. They're coming to physicians for an average of whatever it is, 13 or 12 visits over the course of pregnancy. They're spending a lot of time in doctor's offices. They don't want to spend a ton of time extra on top of that um, doing this. They need things that can fit into their lives, where they can make use of the, the visits that they're already making, and they can really connect with people, because that's ongoing. So the five A's of healthy pregnancy weight gain. So and I don't think even Aria's seen all of these different slides, so this will be interesting. <laughs> Um, so, many of you may know that uh, one of the strategies that we are hoping to use and we are hoping to ultimately roll out as a more universal strategy is, is an adaptation of the five A's. And I'm assuming that all of you are highly um, aware and knowledgeable on the five A's for, <laughs> the five A's for obesity management. So this is an, ad an adaptation. We've got a new color scheme. We are trying to get away from a too pink color scheme, but um, we've gone for the bright pastels. That was the, and it has the same flow, the same general feel to it. But I want to highlight some of the nuanced differences. So. We start, as with the other five A's, we start with the guiding principles, or the key principles. So the first key principle is discuss gestational weight gain with every woman who is pregnant or planning a pregnancy. Now right off the bat, that first key principle then is nuanced. It's different than what you would do with obesity management, because this means this conversation needs to happen with every woman who comes in, regardless of what her starting body weight is. So it's interesting thinking about how the five A's translates, but it's nuanced. And, and I, I think that that's the biggest message I have currently about the five A's. And we're going to see how it works. Um, so I'll be interested to hear your, uh, the results of your discussion in uh, a little bit here. Achieving healthy weight gain, uh, gestational weight gain, is about improving mother and baby's health and well-being. So making sure that it's the two pieces, it's not just the individual's health, it's the individual and her developing offspring. Early action um, means early in pregnancy, um, or as early in pregnancy as possible, addresses root causes, barriers, and emphasizes facilitators. Is the root cause of the typo? Or? Oh yes, it is a typo, thank you. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, maybe I should leave it. We should think about that. That's true. Yes, it is a typo. Thanks for catching that. But maybe not. Maybe it was, you know, a Freudian slip. Freudian typing slip. That's right. Um, health beliefs about pregnancy related, oh, about are, are pregnancy related and they can be very powerful. Sorry, I was probably making these slides a bit too quickly. And understanding the cultural context is critical. And again, this, these, these um, health beliefs around pregnancy are very deep-rooted and go back generations. You know, how can you tell me that what my grandmother is telling me is not right? How can you do that? that you, you must be nuts, right? So 
really understanding the influence of that, and that I think is even more powerful during pregnancy than probably many other life stages. Um, and the goals are healthy behaviors, eating well, remaining physically active, weight gain is the outcome. And I think that harkens back to the, um, that harkens back to the five A's, but it's also nuanced because it's within a very short time frame, right? We're talking six, or, well, depending on when they come, you know, six to nine months. Um, again, we've got the five A's of pregnancy, healthy pregnancy weight gain. So ask, assess, advise are the first three steps. Um, but unlike the obesity management ones, weight gain is healthy and is expected in pregnancy. So here we're talking about behaviors that can support healthy weight gain, but it's supporting healthy weight gain. It's not supporting weight maintenance. It's not supporting weight loss. And so that's, again, that nuance. Every pregnant woman expects to and is recommended to gain some amount of weight. Amounts differ. Rates differ, but that weight gain is expected. And providing education about what those recommended amounts are could be really critical. Women, many women in the literature as well as in our apron project have reported that um, they get weighed all the time, all the time, every visit, but that people don't close the loop. I don't know what my weight was. I'm not sure why I was weighed. I guess they're looking for something. I'm sure if there was a problem, they would tell me. So these are the kinds of comments that you can find both in literature and in some of the work we've done. Um, assessing, there we have root causes of guideline discordant weight gain, weighing women at every visit, and using the four M's. And it's the same four M's to assess drivers and barriers. But the four M's are a little bit different because things like nausea and vomiting, I can tell you on our working group, we had a lot of discussion. Where do you put morning sickness. Is that a mental M? Is it a mechanical M? Is it a metabolic M? It's probably not milieu. Okay, we agreed on that one. But, you know, women make choices because they can't drink anything else or eat anything else. I mean, you've worked with, with uh, women probably during pregnancy. You know, on an anecdotal level, I've had friends who claim all they could drink for their whole pregnancy was green Kool-Aid. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else went down. Nothing else stayed down. Green Kool-Aid. Had to be green. No other color. Had to be Kool-Aid. That was it. Um, advising on excess pregnancy weight gain risks and management options. This, again, is a little bit, um, I would say it actually was quite controversial in our um, international workshop because one of the things that's been found to be very powerful in helping women during pregnancy is, is really empowering women to take a look at their own lives and I identify where they think changes could be or need to be made. So this whole word advise, while it's, it was fine, I think, in terms of working within the five A's, and you're probably very used to this, where I certainly was, but I was surprised that people had a really um, powerful response, adverse and powerful response to this, because how can you, I mean, you know, how can the healthcare provider tell the woman what to do? She knows what her environment is, and she knows what that should be like, and so Again, we've used the word advise in, in context with the five A's, but everyone agrees, of course, the behavioral strategies have to be feasible, sustainable, and um, th they influence both the mother and the baby, and working to figure out how to do that is critical. Agreeing on a realistic SMART plan, focusing on behavioral changes. One of the big questions that came up, well, what happens if women exceed those recommendations? Then where do you go? Well, you know, it's all gone to hell in handbasket anyway. Just go for it. Forget it. You know, no more guidelines for you. Um, but the recommendation is to meet the recommended rates of weekly weight gain. So even if a woman has exceeded the total weight gain um, recommendations prior to delivery, where you would go next would be to look at what the recommended rates of weekly weight gain are and, and aim for that for the, the rest of the pregnancy. 
And then assisting um, is, of course, offering things like um, education resources, referring to providers. Follow-up is something that's almost always arranged in this case because they almost always have another visit. But really helping to um, identify and seek out credible sources of information. Women in the apron study told us, we don't want another pamphlet. We want practical advice. We want somebody to tell us what to do. We want somebody to give us concrete information. And that was really critical. So we do have a project that is starting up hopefully in the uh, early in the new year looking at developing, we've almost finished the development as you can see and testing the resources um, that um, will be the five A's. Um, and we, so we've done this part and then we have a project that's going to look at how well the five A's um, can work for and with healthcare providers and pregnant women and we will also ask, look at the quanti quantitative piece but also look at what people think are the strengths, limitations, effectiveness and acceptability. And I'll just put a shameless plug out there for anybody who might care to be involved in this as a healthcare provider. I would be very happy to talk to you in the future. Um, so in this, again, we're going to run a small randomized control trial, but then with the women and healthcare providers, conduct focus groups and surveys. So some of the areas that we really want to explore and that I think might be really helpful for this group to explore one is identifying, we've called it identifying the workforce. So given what has to happen within visits with pregnant women, who are the right people to deliver these messages, to spend time with women, to deliver short messages, long messages, to be those supports? I think this is something that's really critical. Who is it who is best situated, trained, etc.? to assist and assess women. Um, looking at current strategies, um, what are you doing or what's being done within the context of a clinic now um, to promote healthy weight gain and healthy eating? And what are the challenges in helping women achieve those goals? What are the resources that healthcare providers think would help to maximize the impact of a process like the five A's. Um, there needs to be some work around self-efficacy in promoting healthy eating, um, the needs for screening, assessment, tracking tools, who needs those things? Dietitians may not need, for example, an assessment tool for healthy eating, but if it was going to be done with other healthcare providers, they may need some further training on assessment, for example. Um, how and when women, uh, healthcare providers would like women to access assessment tools. So I'll just use the healthy eating example. There's been um, studies done with computers in offices. So while women are waiting for their um, visits with any number of healthcare providers, they can do dietary recalls, they can do a number of online um, places. There's some playing cards that have been used in the obesity area. Maybe those could be identified and modified for pregnancy so that women have a list of what they could talk to, uh, talk about with their healthcare providers, whoever they happen to be. Um, and then what are the perceived needs, gaps, and opportunities to promote healthy um, weight and healthy diets um, during pregnancies within a clinic setting or within any kind of a healthcare provider setting? So I'll just come back to those first discussion questions. Um, what practical advice, strategies, or other supports are you currently using? Do you know about that help support these two, um, this behavior plus the outcome of weight? How can health professionals best support women in choosing healthy diets? What supports or strategies <coughs> excuse me, do healthcare providers feel are needed in order to accomplish this? I haven't said one word about postpartum except to say, again, it's one of these lurking things out in the, it's currently a little bit in the ether in this particular project, 
but there's this, it harkens back to this that data that I showed you. Women gain, who gain too much weight during pregnancy are not likely, to, many of them are not likely to lose all that weight during the postpartum period, which then, actually about a third of our women in apron went up by one full BMI category. So if they were normal weight, they went up to an overweight category, like one whole category, not just one point, one whole category within... Was that 12 weeks? Yeah. Now, you know, so they went up one whole category. So the woman who gains too much weight in her first pregnancy may be coming back for her second pregnancy or for her third pregnancy in a different category than where she was seen two years earlier, three years earlier. Do you change the categories based on the gain through pregnancy? They, there are no weight gain. There are no BMI. BMI doesn't make sense. But your weight gain, what you say, you should be getting this much per week and say they gain too much too fast. Do you ultra reduce it? No. No. So the trajectory is, is the same. It's just during trimesters two and three, and the trajectory is the same. And so this is one of the challenges, right? Because probably most women... I haven't been pregnant, but friends of mine who are will say, I woke up one day and none of my clothes fit. And I had to go out and buy new underwear, you know, before I went to work because none of my clothes fit. I don't know, overnight I put on whatever, some number of, of uh, pounds. So these are things, these are nuances that, again, we haven't addressed. Um, questions? When you're talking about large gestational babies, does that account in any way for gestational diabetes? Uh, it, it, that one, that particular analysis removed uh, women who had gestational diabetes. Yeah. So that was just based on pre-pregnancy weight and then on weight gain during pregnancy. I have, yes, go ahead. Um, the increased weight gain, is that, has that been happening mm. uh, for generations? Is that typical or is this a newer problem? You know, I think... I think it's a newer problem. I think that um, recommendations, so recommendations back in the 60s and 70s, women were really recommended to gain very small amounts of weight, right? And, and they were given very strict diets. I mean, um, I can speak um, for, you know, I know my mother, for example, was given a list of what her caloric intake should have been during pregnancy and um, was given very strict recommendations for how much weight she should gain. Now, I'm fairly old, so, you know, that was a long time ago. Over the next, I don't know, two decades or so, it really became this case of gain at least. And so it was really well documented anyway. After about the mid-1990s until, and it's, it's been shown across Canada, it's been shown in at least three cohorts now in Canada, and many, many places worldwide with the same trends, who adopted the same recommendations. The Swedes, the US, the UK, Canada, we've all seen the same trends. These very high weight gains um, and so I think it is, part of it also is, is that it goes hand in hand with the recognition of the obesity epidemic and the initiation of that, where we have more women entering pregnancy at heavier body weights to start with. So what's, you know, it, it, part of it, it, it may be that as well. But if you've got heavy women and then they're already putting on way too much weight and you haven't set a limit and you just say, well, just, you know, gain at least... Um, you can see that it's quite easy for them to exceed the current guidelines. Um, yeah, so. I have a personal experience. Both my pregnancies, nobody told me what I should gain at all. Mm -hmm. They never gave me any guidelines to eating. It was mm -hmm. just have a pregnancy, go for it. Mm -hmm. So nobody had a discussion at all. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that speaks to closing the loop, which... Women postpartum, at least, have told us and other researchers that they would like to have the loop closed. There's so many things that happen during any prenatal visit. Denise was giving me the lowdown on all the different things. It, I thought it was interesting that women said 
if my doctor or if my healthcare provider doesn't mention it, it can't be a problem, right? That if there was something really important, they would tell me. And they were shocked to think, to find out that there was a recommended weight gain range, really? Like, they were really shocked. Now, that doesn't mean to say that healthcare providers aren't telling them. I think there's lots of evidence as well to say that healthcare providers do tell them. But, you know, maybe it's not being said often enough. Maybe it's being said in amongst many, many other parts of those visits where there's things that are seem more important and maybe are more important. Like if somebody has preeclampsia, I too would say that's more important than, you know, where your weight gain is. Your weight gain may be a reflection of <coughs> your preeclampsia and so forth. So women may have trouble sifting through those priorities. Um, but, you know, so it's complicated. That's the bottom line. Well, and they've developed the information vortex. Yeah, 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 that's right. That's right. Yeah, and so, you know, again, things like repeating those messages over different parts of the pregnancy. So it may not be just a one-time one deal. It may speak to, you know, reinforcement and so forth. I have one other thing I just want to share with you, and it's just because it's just coming out. And I haven't tried this. We haven't, this was not, never really intended for pregnancy. But, um, so myself and another professor at the U of A have developed a menu plan and recipe book that it's called the Pure Prairie Eating Plan. Um, Fresh, practical menus and a healthy lifestyle. We developed it for um, people with diabetes, type 2 diabetes, to help them um, follow all of, again, the complicated sets of recommendations for um, type 2 diabetes. It will be available on Amazon very shortly, either tomorrow <laughs> or next week. Um, the reason I bring it forward is that actually one of the people who was working on it, her daughter, was has recently had uh, a baby and when we were proofing it and so forth so the way that it's set out I'll just tell you a little bit about it the way that it's set out is that it has um, it has a menu plan a weekly menu plan it's got a recipe list it's got recipes and pictures and all that sort of stuff in here it's got portion sizes spelled out it's got um, grocery lists pantry lists and again, it's written as a menu plan. It's got tips for how you, it's got the food group servings already identified, and it's got tips for if you wanted to increase by 200 calories, add these, these, and these, and if you want to decrease by 200 calories, remove this, this, and this. <clears throat> it meets the healthy eating guidelines, uh, Canada, uh, eating well with healthy, eating hell with Canada, eating well, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't say that last one. <laughs> Eating well with Canada's food guide. Um, so it meets that and it meets the diabetes guidelines. Um, so here's an example of the menu plan. And then it's got tips about adjusting the menu. And then it's got recipes and so forth. And in our people with type 2 diabetes, it's been tested in about <laughs> 120 people. And they love it. And we've seen really Im um, significant improvements in a one We've seen um, modest improvements in diet quality overall. Um, people, people like it. And what they like about it is it's so practical. <coughs> and it's so straightforward. And so I would actually love to try this as one of the ways for pregnant women, ways for guiding pregnant women, because I think what our people with diabetes tell us is that it gives them something concrete to work from. By the time they've worked through this for a month, they have a really good idea about what healthy eating choices should be and what their diet should be, and they understand Canada's food guide servings and so forth. I don't know if the same thing would happen with pregnancy, um, but I'd like to try, and maybe that would be something that you know, people in your group may want to think about because it's very practical. So I just bring that forward. You can have a look at it if you like. But, uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thank you. That was yeah.